Okay, hi there, welcome to the second in our series of videos on labour market failure. And uh, in the first video, we looked at four examples of market failure, including skills gaps, geographical immobility of labour, economic inactivity, and inequality and working poverty. In this video, we'll take a look at discrimination and also the increasingly topical issue of monopsony. So discrimination in the labour market is a cause of market failure. It occurs when employers, businesses, make decisions on wages and who to give jobs to based on perhaps prejudices, based on some defined characteristic which an employer doesn't, doesn't like, such as race, gender, religion, uh, ethnic background. And it can lead to significant variations in wages for the same job and also different employment rates within a population. Um, why is discrimination the cause of market failure? Well, fundamentally, it is the result of often quite deep-rooted, embedded information failure and prejudice. Employers taking some, some characteristics of people that they think are salient, they think they're important, when in fact they're probably not. And discrimination, crucially, leads to scarce human resources, the labour input being underutilised, which in turn feeds into slower trend growth of GDP. Uh, discrimination can also lead to and cause a persistent lack of diversity in the workplace and that can hamper innovation and productivity. There's quite a few studies that have come out, come out saying that more diverse labour forces are actually more innovative, more productive, more profitable for businesses. And you can make a link with the labour market discrimination to financial markets. Again, some evidence that male-dominated financial markets, particularly in the world of trading and complex financial derivatives, may have contributed to the financial crisis. Had we had, for example, more females working in the financial markets and the CEOs of banks, perhaps we wouldn't have ended up in the mess that we did. The gender pay gap, of course, is an important aspect of um, labour market discrimination. I'm not going to go through this in any detail on this video, Safe to say that the gender pay gap remains large, although it is falling in the UK. If you take the pay gap for median gross hourly earnings um, in the UK, the latest data shows a gender pay gap of about 17%. The gender pay gap is calculated as the difference between the, av the average hourly earnings of men and women as a proportion of average hourly earnings. So, for example, a 15% pay gap means that women on earn women on average earn 15% less per hour on average than men. But if you want to look at the gender pay gap in more detail, uh, then um, just click your smartphone or point the smartphone camera at the QR code there. A bit of analysis in terms of discrimination. I think the crucial thing is to be able to use an analysis diagram if you can for available. Um, crucially, what tends to happen if you think about a group that's discriminated against is that the employer may perceive that one group of potential workers is less productive, less valuable than another. That feeds into a lower expected marginal revenue product shown here in the fact the labour demand curve for the discriminated group is lower to the left than the marginal revenue product normally. And the result is that the wage will be paid is going to be less and fewer people are employed. So the discriminated group will have fewer job opportunities and may have to may have to take lower pay as a result. But again, increasing evidence that in the long term, diversity enhances business performance. Studies showing that businesses perform better, commercial returns are higher when they have greater ethnic and gender diversity. Of course, the UK now is insisted by law that companies have to publish the gender pay details of any business with more than 250 people. And um, some thoughts that the law might be strengthened so that there must be at least a third of, of women as senior directors on boards of companies by 2020. Monopsony power is an increasingly important aspect of labour market economics and it's tested more regularly now on exam papers. Um, in a nutshell, monopsony is the employer-led buying power in the labour market. It's when you have a single dominant buyer of a particular type of labour. The NHS, for example, employing doctors and nurses, big employers in service sectors such as Capita, G4S, Amazon, Sports Direct, the big retailers, for example, might be included. And in theory, a monopsony employer will tend 
to pay relatively lower wages than in a competitive labour market. I'm going to take you through the theory here and then think about how you can address the issue. Monopsy power is now becoming a mainstream part of economic thinking. Uh, according to the late and great economist Alan Kruger, uh, labour market monopsonization, the exercise of employer market power, is now becoming very dominant, particularly amongst those supersized companies like Apple and Google and, and uh, Amazon, and may actually contribute to wage stagnation, rising inequality, and perhaps in the long term to declining productivity. So here's the analysis of monopsony not required by all exam boards, but still worth understanding. Uh, the labour demand curve is the marginal revenue product curve. And we're going to assume here that to attract extra workers, this particular firm has to bid the wage up. So that's the labour supply curve. But in doing so, providing it pays each extra worker and all workers the extra wage, the marginal cost of labour will be higher than the average cost. So the profit maximising employment level is where marginal cost of labour meets marginal revenue product, which is at employment level E2. Um, and the value of the marginal revenue product of those workers employed is W2. However, the monopsony power of the employer allows them to pay a wage W3. They only use the labour supply curve to work out which wage they can charge or which wage they can offer. So workers are offering value of W2, but they're only getting paid W3. And that suggests that there's some underpayment, suggesting here there's an exploitation of the labour force. They're not getting paid their true marginal revenue product. So in this scenario, the monopsony employer can use their, their buying power, their relative buying power over the limited bargaining power of workers, to pay a wage that's lower than the value of the marginal revenue product. In that sense, the monopsony can exploit workers. Alan Kruger is brilliant on this. Uh, Kruger is one of those great labour market economists, sadly passed away in the spring of 2019, who understood how labour markets affect millions of working people. Kruger's work was instrumental in overcoming the standard theory, which says that a minimum wage will necessarily cost lots of jobs. His research famously found that a higher minimum wage, if set at the right level, can have virtually no effect on unemployment, at least in the short term. So what are the, the possible interventions if you have monopsony power in markets? How can you remedy the imbalance in power between the employer and the employee? Let me pick out four for you. One, of course, is to introduce a statutory minimum wage, especially targeting occupations where there are lots of low paid workers. Secondly, you can improve the basic employment rights, protection of employment rights that people have, in rights to maternity and paternity leave, rights to um, against unfair dismissal, rights to sick leave and health care and paid holiday. Thirdly, in the long term, of course, you might want to tilt the balance more towards labour by encouraging more people to join unions, to increase union density as a percentage of the employed labour force. And Kruger also argued that you should enhance your scrutiny of mergers for adverse labour market effects. So, for example, you might consider blocking a merger if it led to a business having significant monopoly power in the selling of the market, selling of the goods market, but also increasing power in the labour market. So perhaps t tailor your competition policy to address monopsony power in the labour market. I'm just going to take you through how a monopsony might be affected by a minimum wage. Here's our situation we had before. The wage paid is W3 and employment is E2. Well, if we introduce a minimum wage set above the monopsony wage, which I've put in here in the, as a green line, so employers cannot pay below that wage, and therefore that effectively becomes the marginal labour cost curve um, across that range of employment. And if that's the case, that green line intersects with marginal revenue product here at employment level E3. So the new profit maximising employment level is E3, which is a higher employment level, paying a higher wage than the previous wage paid by the monopsony. So in this situation, this diagram, um, introducing a minimum wage with a monopsonist can actually increase employment and increase wages, which goes against the traditional theory. 
Just finally, thinking about evaluation points, if you get a question on interventions in the labour market, we've talked about minimum wages, we've mentioned in the previous video rent controls, for example, tax-free childcare, all those kind of interventions. Uh, crucially, think about effectiveness. Do interventions actually work in meeting specific aims? If you think an intervention is ineffective, then you might want to bring in an alternative policy as part of your evaluation. When we intervene, inevitably, there are going to be winners and they're going to be losers. So which stakeholders are impacted? Who gains? Who loses? Um, in that sense, what are the distributional consequences? What happens if the interventions don't work or potentially cause unintended negative consequences? So what are the risks of government failure from labour market interventions? Linking micro and macro. So can an effective, timely intervention in the labour market actually have an impact not just in the, at a micro level but perhaps improve one or more macro objectives such as growth productivity trade and inflation and crucially think about the evidence if you can perhaps this is a data response question is there some evidence about the impact of interventions you will you have your theory in theory x will happen but in practice what does the evidence show about the consequences of interventions OK, thanks for joining in the second video on labour market failure. Again, if you want to access all of our labour market economic resources, just point your smartphone at the QR code and that should take you to our landing page. Thanks a lot.